what they're doing is that what the Masons did was they basically said, we're going to take good men and make better men, which is kind of they do the people. They don't really know what they're getting into before they get into it. So the bottom line was, as I was booking in entertainment, and my mother was extremely upset that I took that job, so she brought me this book called Freemasonry Unmasked, written by John Salzer. So I was introduced to John Salzer through my dear mother, who left us in 2013. But this book was unbelievable. It really changed me because I realized I didn't know the history of Freemasonry in this country and how tremendously linked our country is to Freemasonry. It's printed on your money. It's in every institution. It's in all the banking systems of the world. And it scared the living crap out of me. And there was a darkness to that building in Detroit. So I reached out to John. And John had to be very careful because he left the lodge. In five short months, John became, they wanted him to be a worshipful master of his own lodge. He was a 32nd degree Scottish Rite Mason. He was a proficiency card holder, which means he knew all the rituals of masonry. He was like one of the finest in the country. And in addition to that, he was up for the 33rd degree and he was a Shriner. So you have to reach the 32nd degree of Scottish Rite Masonry, 13th degree of York Rite Masonry, or you have to climb very high in the commandery to even be a Shriner. And then John told me something that really shocked me. When he became a Shriner, he had to swear his soul on the Quran. Yes, you ever see the Shriners? They have the red fezes and they have the Muslim symbol on it. You have now sworn your soul on the Quran. But that's the least of it. Just in the first three degrees of Blue Lodge Masonry, you've, you've damned yourself. You, you go to the second degree of Freemasonry, you can't even receive communion. The enemy of Freemasonry is the Roman Catholic Church and vice versa. So he's written a lot of books, Why Catholics Cannot Be Masons, The Biblical Basis for Purgatory, A Catechism on Fatima. He's an expert. He's an apologist on Fatima. He's been on EWTN countless times. He was a keynote speaker at the Angelus Conference in St. Louis, Missouri in 2018. He's known worldwide. So I thought it was important for us to understand the long arm of Freemasonry, not only in the formation of this country, but even today, even though the numbers are dwindling. If you're in the banking system and you're high ranking, odds are you're a Mason. They control many institutions in the world. You've heard of globalism. You might as well call it Freemasonry. With that, I'm going to turn it over to my friend and brother, John Salta. Thank you, Steve. Gentlemen, it's great to be with you. I really am an open agenda this evening as to where you want to take this. Um, what Steve says is very true, but that's certainly not how masonry is presented uh, to individuals when they're recruited. Um, this was 25 plus years ago for me when I was recruited into joining Freemasonry right after my graduation from law school. And it's presented as simply uh, a fraternal organization, a brotherhood uh, that can open the door uh, for you to help uh, you, know, you have business contacts in the business world. So the appeal to me was, hey, John, this is the most ancient and order, uh, honorable order in the world. And by joining Masonry, you're, you're going to get to know other lawyers, judges, police officers, <clears throat> political officials, and, and so forth. And so as a young lawyer, boy, that sounds pretty good. You know, I didn't know much about Masonry, although as a cradle Catholic, I was born and raised Catholic. I certainly wasn't looking to... <laughs> you know, renounce my faith or join another religion. And by the way, that's what Freemasonry formally is. It is an anti-Catholic religion. But I did have uh, a sense that the church had spoken about this at some point, And I didn't do much research about it because I relied upon the men who were recruiting me. And by the way, they were all Catholic. 
men. Um, some were family members, others were friends of family. These are men that were much older than me, men that I grew up with, that are respected, and, and generally that's the way it works. You know, you trust the the gentlemen that are that are soliciting you. And by the way, that's the first lie of Freemasonry. Freemasonry claims that you know to ask one, you know, to be one, you ask one. There's a bumper sticker, a Masonic bumper sticker. Well, that's not true. I mean, Masonry actively recruits, so that's the that's the lie right off the bat that they don't recruit anybody. But that's that's not true. I was aggressively recruited. But I did have a, a, a recollection that the church may have had a negative judgment on, on masonry. So, you know, prior to joining, I actually contacted my, my parish priest and then asked him about it. And he said he didn't study the matter. And he said, as long as I recognize the distinction between the church and the lodge, it would be permissible to join. Of course, you know, he was speaking in ignorance because he hadn't studied the matter. But when I began studying the matter, I, I, I realized that there was no excuse because the church has condemned Freemasonry just about more than any other error that, that she has in, in her entire history. And, you know, to be clear, Freemasonry, as I said, it is a religion. It's not presented that way, but it has all the elements of, of religion. Um, it has its own names for God, its own names for heaven, its own prayers, its own rituals, its own vestments, its own meeting places. It has an altar. It has implements of worship. Uh, it has its own sacramental system with covenant oaths that Masons swear upon the altar uh, under blood-curdling penalties, which are symbolic of covenant oaths. When a man swears an oath at the Masonic altar under the penalties of having his his throat cut across and his body severed in twain and his bowels taken thence and his heart plucked out. Um, he's symbolically offering, offering his own blood on the Masonic altar and entering into a covenant with Freemasonry. Um, and by that fact, he's objectively leaving his former religion, the Catholic religion uh, for, for a Catholic. Uh, that's what's so pernicious about those oaths. And so that's why men who go through these things, they have to go to confession, they have to renounce these oaths, they're sacrilegious covenantal oaths, they're demonic oaths, uh, and, you know, you know, by God's grace, I was, I was able to, to do that, but it, it's not evident um, when you're recruited, and it's not even evident when you first join the lodge. Um, there are things that don't seem quite right, but it takes a while for you to truly understand uh, what they're teaching, because they do it in a very gradual way. Um, you know, there's an altar, there's a Bible on the altar, um, Psalms are recited, there are references to God and so forth, and even eternal life. Now, they call this a fraternity, so you first might ask the question, why is a fraternity uh, talking about God and eternal life, and why does it gather around an altar with scriptures on it? I mean, that's, that is, seems a little bit odd for, for a fraternity, doesn't it? But, you know, for, for the Catholic who sees these things, that seems harmless enough, right? We believe in the scriptures, and this seems to be, you know, religious in a sense, but nothing is, is, is seems to be overtly contradictory to our faith until you study the rituals themselves. And this is what I did. This is how I had to learn this. Remember, when most Masons join Freemasonry, they really don't understand the rituals because most of the meetings, just like the Knights of Columbus meetings, they don't generally involve um, initiation rituals. They're talking about the business, you know, the charities, things they're going to do for the community. Um, but in, in Freemasonry, <clears throat> not only do you have to truly study the rituals, but all of the rituals are written in a secret ciphered format. So they're not even intelligible um, to the non-Mason. The only way those things are ciphered is through oral tradition. I had, to, I had to sit down with other Masons and go through the cipher and then write down uh, you know, what these things meant in order to memorize the rituals. And then as, as you do that, I mean, I, I came of, of an awareness very, very clearly that uh, Masonry was, was teaching principles contrary to the Catholic faith. And that is really the goal and aim of Freemasonry. Masonry uh, is, is to overthrow Christ in the Catholic Church and the entire Catholic social order. That's the goal of Freemasonry. 
And the method by which it seeks to do that is to attack the dogmas of the Catholic faith. Okay, remember I said that, to attack the dogmas of the Catholic faith. They start by rejecting the revelations of God. You know, the Catholic religion is a religion that has been revealed to us by God, the only true religion. God has revealed he's a trinity of persons. He sent his son. He established the church, the seven sacraments. Freemasonry rejects all that God has supernaturally revealed. It limits man's understanding to God based upon what, God, what, what man can understand through his own reason and nature. And that's why the popes have called it a religion of naturalism, you see. So by rejecting the dogmas of the faith, Freemasonry is its own religious system, and it's a religion of naturalism. And so that's, that's the goal of, of Freemasonry. Uh, Steve mentioned uh, that he wanted me to talk a little bit about, you know, masonry's impact on, on the church. And we could do a whole course in history on uh, the revolutions that Freemasonry has been behind. And again, all these revolutions have the principal objective of, of destroying the faith of the people. And then once it destroys the faith of the people, uh, it can exert its power and influence over the people and ultimately take control of them, which is, which is actually also the aim of communism. And this is why Pope Leo XIII, for example, said that Freemasonry and communism work in tandem. Uh, they work together. They have the same objective of, of overthrowing the Catholic social order by rejecting the dogmas of the faith. It is not a conspiracy theory to suggest that Freemasonry intended to and has infiltrated the Catholic Church. Uh, that's historical fact. Uh, it's been established through a number of writings. I can refer you to, to some of the uh, some of the events uh, that I myself have discovered. But there was uh, a a group of Freemasonry in Italy called the Carbonari, uh, and it was a, a sect of Freemasonry that drafted an elaborate plan in the early 19th century. Uh, to infiltrate the Catholic Church, primarily by infiltrating its seminaries uh, and by putting men who espoused Masonic principles, uh, men who would be willing to teach in a way that would ultimately undermine the Catholic faith. And the Masons were very cunning about this. They said it's not going to take months or even years, but perhaps a century. And the popes discovered these writings, for example, and, and, and there's a little booklet out by my good late friend, John Venari, called the Alta Vendita, uh, which is effectively the Masonic writing. Uh, and Gregory XVI, Pope Gregory XVI, discovered uh, these writings um, in the eight, uh, early 1800s through a pontifical raid of uh, a, Masonic, uh, a Masonic lodge uh, to procure these writings, to discover that, in fact, the Masons intended to infiltrate the church. Uh, Pius IX uh, in 1861 gave an approbation to these writings, acknowledging their authenticity, and Pope Leo XIII ordered their publication. So we have three popes saying that this, in fact, is what Masonry intended to do. Uh, we also have an historical record of, of people who were part of this infiltration that actually came out and converted to the Catholic faith and testified to the fact that they were putting these men into the seminaries. Uh, for example, uh, a gentleman named Douglas Hyde, uh, a woman named Bella Dodd. Uh, these were ex-communists who in the 1930s, uh, Bella Dodd converted the Catholic faith. She said by the 1930s, they had put over 1,100 men into the priesthood at that time uh, in order to destroy the church from within. And, and, and Ms. Dodd even said that the objective was that uh, at some point the church will no longer even be recognizable as the Catholic church. This was the plan of Freemasonry. And we can tie this historical factual account back to revelations that Our Lady gave. And I'm going to talk about Fatima but we can actually point to a, an apparition uh, where Our Lady came 300 years before Fatima. And this is a church-approved apparition. It's been approved by all of the bishops uh, in Quito, Ecuador, where Our Lady appeared to a sister, Mariana de Jesus Torres, uh, whose body, by the way, is incorrupt. Her cause for canonization has been opened. 
But Our Lady appeared to Sister Mariana uh, in the 16th century, in very early 17th century, and warned that Freemasonry would infiltrate the Catholic Church. Now, this is quite incredible because the first modern Masonic Lodge wasn't even founded until 100 years after that, in 1717. But Our Lady, since God told her what the future was, she was able to communicate this. And I want to just read a couple quotes because Our Lady is very specific about what she said to Sister Mariana. She used the word Mason and Masonry. She says this in 1610. She says, quote, shortly after the middle of the 20th century, Satan will reign almost completely by means of the Masonic sects. And she goes on to say, during that epoch, during that period of mid 20th century, the church will find herself attacked by terrible hordes of the Masonic sect. So we have a revelation from the mother of God 300 years before Fatima warning us that Freemasonry would penetrate the church just after the middle of the 20th century. Okay. And she says that during this time of this Masonic infiltration, which we now have confirmed through the approbations of, of three popes, she said during this time, the church would be afflicted by and punished for the sins of heresy, impiety, and impurity. Those were the three sins that she said would be afflicting the church through this period. So, this is very powerful because in my research, I made a connection between these revelations at Quito, Ecuador, and the revelations of Our Lady of Fatima 300 years later in 1917. Our Lady came to Fatima in 1917, Fatima, Portugal, and you probably know a little bit of the story. She appeared to the three shepherd children, and uh, she gave what are called three secrets or three components to the one grand secret of Fatima. The first secret was a, a terrifying vision of hell where she showed the children hell, you know, beneath the earth. And she said, these are, this is the place where, where poor sinners go and that you have to pray for sinners. That was the first part of the revelation. The second part uh, of the revelation, our lady predicted uh, that, uh, if men don't stop offending God, World War I would end, but a greater war, meaning World War II, would break out during the reign of Pius XI. Now, remember, this was in 1917. Um, the kids didn't know who Pius XI was. Our Lady was speaking uh, about, about the future. And there is a third part of the secret, which is part of this mystery of Fatima, um, it is this third part of the secret that I would maintain explains in great detail this subversion of the church. When you read Sister Lucia's memoir, the third secret starts with the phrase, in Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved. And it stops there. She puts an etc. there as a holding holder place for Our Lady's remaining words. Now, Sister Lucia wrote down the third secret in two documents. She wrote down the vision that Our Lady gave and the explanation of the vision that Our Lady gave. And some of the gentlemen here may be old enough to remember that there was a great anticipation for the secret to be revealed in 1960. My parents have told me about it. My grandparents have told me about it. I wasn't alive then. Steve, I don't think you were either. and You couldn't have remembered it if you were. But Our Lady ordered that the third secret of Fatima be released in 1960. And in fact, we know this because Cardinal Bertoni in 2007 produced the two envelopes of the two texts and on the envelopes in Lucia's handwriting, it says by express order of Our Lady to be opened in 1960. Well, what happened in 1960? We know that John the 23rd did not reveal the secret of Fatima. In fact, the Vatican, 40 years later, revealed the first part of the secret in the year 2000. Uh, you may recall this during the pontificate of John Paul II, where the Vatican revealed this horrible vision of a bishop dressed in white who appears to be the Pope, and he's martyred in 
what appears to be Rome. We don't know, but it's a city in ruins, uh, along with other, you know, clerics and, and, and faithful. Um, but there's more to it because uh, Our Lady wouldn't have given an obscure vision like that to the children if she didn't explain it. Of course, she explained it. And the, what I maintain and what other Fatima scholars maintain is that this explanation of the vision is part of this third secret of Fatima, which was supposed to be revealed in, in 1960, and it still hasn't been revealed yet. And one can only speculate why that is. I think it's reasonable to speculate that if the secret somehow warns uh, of a subversion in the Catholic Church, just after the middle of the, the, uh, the, the 20th century, perhaps some of the clerics thought it was an indictment of their own programs. That's only a speculation, but for whatever reason, um, this is a question that remains unanswered, and it's quite disturbing because, as you can see, the connection in, in Quito, Our Lady said Freemasonry would penetrate the church just after the, middle, after the middle of the 20th century, and at Fatima, Our Lady is also warning about dangers to the church, and she wanted this secret to be revealed at the exact same time just after the middle of the 20th century, in 1960, 300 years later. It's the same message, of course, our message, the message of Our Lady is the same, it doesn't, it doesn't change. What adds to the controversy about this is that many of the top high-ranking clerics of the church say that the, the secret of Fatima, the third secret of Fatima, deals with the infiltration of the church and the loss of souls, primarily priestly souls, wayward priests losing their vocation and leading the faithful into error. Uh, I've written extensively about this. And again, it's not conspiracy theory. These are all top-ranked prelates that are on the record of saying this because they have knowledge about what the third secret says. Uh, for example, Cardinal Chappi, who is the papal theologian of five separate popes, says the third secret reveals that, quote, the apostasy in the church will begin at the top. That's a quote from Cardinal Chappi. Now, who's at the top? The pope is at the top. How, why would he say that when there is nothing in the first two secrets that Our Lady says that addresses the apostasy in the church? It must relate to the third part of the secret that hasn't yet been revealed. Lucia herself in an interview with Father Fuentes in 1957, says the third secret deals with the loss of consecrated souls, wayward priests leading the, feet of the faithful astray. Father Alonso, one of the great Fatima scholars, again says the, the secret of Freemasonry deals with attacks on the dogma of the faith. You see the consistency between these revelations there. Uh, the Bishop of Fatima, Bishop Do Amaral, said that the third secret deals with a loss of the faith. John Paul II said the same thing, that the third secret deals with the, the dangers that threaten the faith in the world. Cardinal Ratzinger has said this as well. And there is also an unknown revelation uh, by a Cardinal Pacelli, who happens to be Pope Pius XII, the, the future Pope Pius XII. There's a book in French written about Pius XII, and the book reports that in 1931, Pius XII had a divine intrusion about the meaning of the third secret of Fatima. He must have because Lucia didn't write down the third secret of Fatima until the 40s. And so this is 1931, and Pope, the future Pope says that he is concerned about Lucia's message to the children about uh, a suicide in the church, of altering the church's faith in her liturgy, her theology, and her soul. This is what Cardinal, uh, Cardinal Pacelli said. And in my research, I find a striking parallel between Cardinal Pacelli's enumeration of the three areas of theology, um, uh, liturgy, and the soul of the church with Our Lady's revelations at Quito, Ecuador. Remember when she says that the sins that God would punish in the church deal with heresy, impiety, and impurity. So here we have warnings of Our Lady, both at Quito and at Fatima, warnings about the dogma of the faith somehow being compromised in the church right after the middle of the 20th century. 
And these relate to attacks on the theology of the church, which results in heresy, attacks on uh, the liturgy of the church, which results in impiety, and an attack on the soul of the church, which results in impurity. The, the, the parallels there are striking. And so we have to ask the question, what could Our Lady possibly be referring to? What happened right after 1960? What happened? Vatican What's that? Vatican II. You got it. It's the Second Vatican Council and the subsequent liturgical reforms that followed it. Now, we can talk about objectively what happened at the council without questioning the motives of the council fathers. I would suspect that many or even most of the council fathers had good intentions. I suspect that it was only a minority of council fathers uh, who were the infiltrators, these infiltrators that were put in the seminaries decades and decades before they came to power at Vatican II. But be that as it may, Vatican II was the event uh, by all reasonable conclusion that Our Lady was warning about. And it's not to say that the council taught anything explicitly heretical, but it's also true to say that the Second Vatican Council was unlike any other council in the history of the Catholic Church, because if you study the other 20 councils of the church, those councils were gathered for two reasons, to dogmatize the faith, to issue dogmas of the faith, and to condemn error, to condemn heresy, to con condemn errors against the faith. And Vatican II didn't do that. She neither... Uh, invoked the Pope's infallibility to dogmatize anything, um, and nor did she condemn errors. There were great hopes that she would condemn the Protestant errors, she would condemn the errors of communism. None of that happened. Uh, instead, um, the Council issued teachings that lacked the precision that normal conciliar documents had throughout the history of the Church. I mean, if you look at the Councils of Florence and Trent and even the First Vatican Council, the dogmatic decrees are taught with such precision. Uh, but in Vatican II, there's, there's language that's used that's it's, it's quite different. It's ambiguous. And in, in fact, some of the teachings might even be uh, said to be quite novel. Um, if you read the document in Vatican II, which is called Dignitatis Humanae, that's the church's document on, on religious liberty. It talks about this right of man having, you know, ha having a, an objective God-given right to, to, to worship as he sees fit. The church never explained it that way. The church has always said, while man may have a, a psychological freedom to worship, he only has a right to worship the way God has revealed in the Catholic Church. Man does not have a right, an objective right to worship outside the Catholic Church. Why? Because man does not have a right to break God's commandments. Man does not have a right to do evil. This is just one of many examples of where, you know, I believe that these, these revolutionaries at the council wanted to introduce ambiguous language, which they even admit they could hijack later. Okay? And so while us Orthodox Catholics want to impose an Orthodox or traditional interpretation on some of the council's teachings, right? The revolutionaries used some of the ambiguity in the council to foist upon the church their uh, erroneous and even heretical ideas. And I do believe this is what Our Lady was warning about. And in, in fact, some of the Masons themselves are on record for praising the teachings of Vatican II. And I can give you a number of, of quotes uh, to, to that end. Um, but that's quite telling when Freemasons are quoting, uh, are quoting the council. Uh, I can find some of these. I don't have them right in front of me. But um, there's, there are some other things that I will uh, point out uh, to you that, that followed Vatican II. There were some reports in the 70s um, where journalists came out and they actually published documentation that there were Freemasons occupying the church. There was a journalist uh, in the 1970s by the name of, of Carmen Pecorelli, Mino Pecorelli. He was uh, a writer for the L'Osservatore Politico in, in, in Italy. He was um, uh, doing his job during the uh, reign of, of Paul VI. And in the 70s, 
he actually published uh, the names of, of high-ranking Freemasons uh, that were cardinals and bishops in the church. He gave them uh, their code names, uh, and he, he published all of this. And some of the, the names he, he mentioned, again, this is, this is uh, in the public record, uh, Cardinal Veal, um, who was a very powerful Vatican prelate, Cardinal Casaroli, um, who they claim manipulated the th third secret. He was one of the the, the prelates that suppressed the third uh, third secret. Annebale Bugnini, whose own autobiography says that he was a Freemason. Bugnini was responsible for drafting uh, the liturgical reform that followed Vatican II. Uh, Pasquale Macche, he was actually the personal secretary of, of Paul VI. And so um, these reports, you know, there, there's, there's a continuity between what Our Lady revealed and then the subversion of the church and then finally documentation coming out saying and actually identifying the Freemasons who are occupying, uh, occupying the church. Um, some speculate, and again, I'm not a, a conspiracy person, so I don't, you know, I, I, I don't assert things I can't prove. I'm a lawyer after all, but I can speculate and some do that John Paul I his life may have been taken at the hands of Freemasons since he wanted to clean up uh, the banking system. As Steve mentioned, they were all involved in, in Freemasonry. He reigned 33 days. How symbolic is, is, is 33 days for a pontificate? Uh, there was another gentleman uh, in the 70s again named Don Francesco Putti. He was the founder of the, uh, the Italian publication CC No No. Uh, he in the 70s also published the names of 12 cardinals who were high-ranking prelates in the Vatican in the 70s. He gave them the dates that they entered Freemasonry. He gave them their Masonic code names. And he also said there were hundreds, hundreds of bishops and priests who were Freemasons at this time in the church. And if you read, uh, if you read the history, uh, he was told that he was threatened with an excommunication. Uh, by revealing this information. And Putti fought back. He said, look, he says, I've only published, you know, the, you know, I've only published the names of these people. But if you push me hard, I'm actually going to publish all the documentation proving what I'm saying. Well, the next day, the Vatican press office says that he was under no uh, excommunication whatsoever. So again, th this is in the journalistic record. You can find this information in the hard books, a lot of this now can actually be found uh, found online. Uh, Saint Peel, uh, Padre Peel himself, uh, also made reference to to Freemasons. In fact, uh, Father Luigi Villa um, was commissioned by the Vatican to expose ecclesiastical Freemasonry, and and uh, Padre Pio was quoted as saying uh, that the church is already invaded by Freemasonry. Freemasonry has already reached the Pope's slippers, end quote. That's a quote by St. Pio himself. And so this great saint recognized how the church had been uh, infiltrated uh, through the, you know, their, their plan that was hatched in this document called the Alta Vendita. I, I do have quotes from some Masons regarding Vatican II that I wanted to, 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 to read to you, because again, it's what they're saying about the church's council. Um, what we see from a French Freemason, his name is Yves Mossedon. He wrote, he wrote a book called Ecumenism Viewed by a Traditional Freemason. And he declared, quote, Catholics must not forget, this is after the council, Catholics must not forget that all roads lead to God. That's not true. And they will have to accept that this courageous idea of free thinking, free Masonic thinking, which we can really call a revolution, pouring forth from our Masonic lodges, has spread magnificently over the dome of St. Peter's. Here is a Freemason praising the church's new direction. Another French Freemason, Jacques Mitterrand, said there's a revel in the, uh, the church saying, quote, something has changed now within the church. The word of the sovereign pontiff is now questioned by bishops, by priests, by faithful. For a Freemason, a man who questions dogma is already a Freemason without an apron. So he was quoting again, talking about the revolution of Freemasonry. And then finally, Yves Congar, one of the so-called experts at Vatican II, 
about Vatican II remarked that, quote, the church has had peacefully its October revolution, its Masonic or Russian revolution. Remember, when Our Lady came to Fatima, she warned that the heirs of Russia, and she was referring to communism, uh, would spread throughout the world. But when she said communism, as Pope Leo XIII had already said, the ideology of communism and Freemasonry are one and the same. Uh, they are intended to completely overthrow the Catholic Church and invert the social order by making state the absolute. And when you make state the absolute, you ultimately lead man to a, an atheism, as the popes have said, putting aside completely the supernatural uh, church of Jesus Christ and his seven sacraments and all the means of salvation that he is, that he is, is given to us. So, you know, that's, that's a lot to throw at you. There's a, there's a lot to unpack here. But I hope in, in that, that brief time period, I, I, I took you through kind of the historical continuum uh, between Quito, Ecuador, and Fatima. We've had revelations subsequent to Fatima, private apparatus the church has also recognized, one being Our Lady of Akita in Japan in 1973, uh, where Our Lady was warning uh, about the turmoil in the church. And if you're familiar with that revelation, she talks about how bishop will oppose bishop, priest will oppose priest. It's exactly what's happening today. She also said that fire will fall from the sky and consume a great part of the faithful. Now, where is that in the first two secrets of Fatima? The reason I say that is because Cardinal Ratzinger said that the revelations of Akita and the revelations of Fatima are the same. Well, if Akita is talking about fire falling from the sky and consuming a great part of humanity, and Fatima doesn't say that in the first two parts of the secret, it must mean that that type of chastisement is disclosed in the third part of the secret, which has still been suppressed by the Vatican. Um, we know now that there is a vision of a pope in a city of ruins. It looks like it was part of a potentially a nuclear wasteland. It's hard to say. Our Lady certainly explains what, what it is. But it's key that the secret of Fatima, just like the revelations of Quito, Ecuador, and Akita, Japan, are prophesying a material chastisement for humanity, the likes of which we have not seen, as well as a spiritual chastisement, which we're living through right now. This, this material chastisement, God help us, has not happened yet. But we are living the spiritual revolution in the church right now. And it's only going to get worse uh, under this pontificate. Uh, and I do acknowledge that Francis is the Pope, and I pray for him every day. Uh, but the reality is that he is only continuing to further this revolution. Um, I find it extremely problematic that when he was elected to the papacy, Argentinian Freemasonry praised his election uh, on, on March 20th of 2013, uh, calling him on their own website, Francis is a co-patriot of ours, and he's promoting the Masonic ideas of liberty, quality, and fraternity. This is what the Grand Lodge of Argentina published about Pope Francis. Imagine, imagine Freemasonry saying anything good about the popes before Vatican II. They hated the popes, and they cursed the popes before Vatican II. Now Freemasonry is praising the popes of Vatican II. Italian Freemasonry did the same thing when Pope Francis was elected. Right after, I think on the day of his elections, uh, his election to the pontificate, they issued a, a congratulatory note to him on their website, uh, and they talked about he's going to be one of the true great popes that will promote the unity of religions. Well, the unity of religions is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ is to re repent and be baptized. He who believes will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. Those are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. He told the apostles in the Great Commission, go therefore and baptize all nations in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. This is the gospel. It's not the gospel of unity of religions. The religion of Freemasonry is the gospel of the unity of religions because Freemasonry in its lodge room, they gather all religious faiths around the Masonic altar. They invite all religious writings to take an equal place with the Holy Scriptures on the Masonic altar. Whether you're a Muslim, 
or a pagan or a Jew or a Protestant. It doesn't matter what religion you are. Um, and so, you know, this is very problematic uh, when you have masonry praising the popes. But it's not just Pope Francis. I, I am happy in being a Catholic apologist and dealing, you know, with these issues for so many years. It's been 20 years since I've been in this business of apologetics. I lived closely through the pontificates of John Paul II and, 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 and Benedict XVI. Uh, and, you know, John XXIII was before my, before my time, and, and I, I was born during the reign of, of Paul, the, Paul VI. But Masons praised those popes, too. Um, uh, John XXIII, for example, Mexican Freemasonry honored him on the day that he died. Brazilian Freemasonry has also honored John Paul II because they have all been in one way or another responsible for promoting the revolution of Vatican II. It's not to question their intentions. I'm not saying that the popes per se had evil intentions, but what I am saying is what Freemasonry said. They don't necessarily want to have a Mason on the seat of Peter, but they wanted a pope who they say would be according to their needs, someone that would give in to a ideology, a liberal philosophy, someone that would maybe turn those reins over to those and would at least be tacitly responsible for the revolution, which, which is what we've seen. So um, we're living through this and we can't deny this. The fact of the matter is most Catholics have fallen away from the faith. Most Catholics don't believe in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Most Catholics don't know their faith. Catholics don't attend mass regularly. Not you gentlemen, but I'm saying if you look at the average Catholic, there clearly has been a loss of faith. Now, it's not to paint a completely bleak picture. I, I mean, I, I, have, I have hope, and Our Lady did give a solution to all of this, which I haven't mentioned yet, but I will now. She mentioned that when the Pope finally consecrates Russia to her Immaculate Heart in union with all the bishops of the world, that God is going to convert Russia to the faith, the Catholic faith, and he's going to grant the world a period of peace. This is going to be the true uh, restoration of Catholicism in the church, and it will infallibly happen because Our Lady guaranteed it. She said in her prophecy in Fatima, the part that she, the Vatican did release, the second part of the secret, she says, in the end, the Pope will consecrate Russia to my Immaculate Heart. The church will be restored. Russia will convert. There'll be a period of, of peace. We should all be praying uh, for this intention daily, making the, the, the five first Saturdays, praying for the Pope to consecrate Russia, because frankly, that's the only supernatural remedy. Um, if this doesn't happen timely, and time I think is running out, Our Lady revealed the desire for the Pope's consecration in 1917. She formally asked for it in 1929. And frankly, beginning with Pius XI, he had the obligation. Well, he didn't do it. Pope Pius XII did two consecrations. He consecrated the world. He didn't consecrate Russia in 1942. In 1952, he did consecrate Russia, but he didn't do it with all the world's bishops. And Lucia followed that by saying it has to be done with all of the world's bishops. Our Lord and Our Lady want a sign of true Catholic unity. I think the reason for that is we, in today's modern church, have a false understanding of what ecumenism is. Ecumenism, when we say something is ecumenical, we mean that we're in union with the Holy Father, the Pope. That's why we call councils of the church ecumenical councils. The Pope is in union with his bishops and then with the faithful. That's what ecumenism is. Ecumenism is not as some of the prelates of the modern church say, that we reach out to all of our brothers and sisters and meet them on an equal level, which, by the way, is a Masonic term, meeting everybody on, a, on an equal level and praying together and disregarding our differences and having unity and diversity. Nonsense. That is not Catholic at all. We love our, our, our fellow man and we pray for their conversion, but it's by virtue of our differences that separate us from, from those outside the church. These differences can't be ignored. You either accept the divinity of Christ or you don't. You either accept that he founded a Catholic church for salvation or you don't. You either accept the seven sacraments or you don't. You either accept Our Lady as the mother of God and, and, and so forth, you see. So really what this is going to hinge on ultimately, I believe, is, is the papal consecration to, to Our Lady's Immaculate Heart. Our Lord wants Our Lady to reign as queen. 
He wants devotion to her immaculate heart to be placed alongside his sacred heart. This is what he has required. And for whatever mysterious reason, and I think the reason is beyond natural explanations. I believe there are super or preternatural explanations, diabolical reasons why uh, this is being somehow held back, that all the forces of hell have been unleashed on the Vatican. If we believe the vision of Pope Leo XIII and the vision that he had, that again in the 20th century there would be uh, countless demons unleashed upon the church with our Lord's permission. Satan wanted an opportunity to attack the church and according to, to the vision, our Lord told, told uh, Satan, you have it, I will give you a hundred years. That hundred years has come and gone and now we're experiencing this, this revolution. So, uh, you know, with, with that, um, there's optimism, but the optimism is going to depend upon, I think, the the Pope to embrace this message of Fatima and to consecrate uh, um, Russia to her immaculate heart. So with that, I'll be happy to, to take questions. John, I have, I have one question, but this is something that always bothered me about masonry. In all countries, you have to believe in a God to become a Mason, except for France, right? In France, you can be an atheist and be a Mason. There is a, <clears throat> there is a strain of, of Freemasonry, um, which the Grand Lodge of England didn't recognize. And so uh, you're right to say that uh, Orthodox Freemasonry, if you will, requires a, a belief in deity. Um, but number one, Steve, that deity does not have to believe to be Jesus Christ, which, by the way, was one of the key issues that I had in my first degree of Freemasonry. Because in the first degree of Freemasonry, and this is what every Mason has gone through who's received the very first degree of Freemasonry. The worshipful master, when you're blindfolded and naked and divested of your religious sacramentals, including your crucifix and your scapular and your wedding ring and going into the lodge uh, half naked, and blindfolded, the worshipful master uh, requires you to make a profession of faith. And he puts his left hand on, your, on the candidate's head and he says, in whom do you put your trust? And if the man professes a belief in Christ, or if the man professes a belief in the great thumb, it really doesn't matter to Freemasonry. As long as he professes a belief in a deity of his choosing, even if it's a false god, Freemasonry tells the man, quote, your trust is in God and your faith is well founded. Arise, follow your conductor and fear no danger. Now, that's a sentence that comes and goes and the ritual carries on, but I had to stop and say, wait a minute. I professed the belief in Christ, but what if I didn't? What if I professed the belief in the great thumb or Allah or Vishnu or Shiva or, or a pagan deity? Well, Freemasonry would be required to tell me my trust is in God. But think about how contrary to reason that is. That not only rejects supernatural revelation, it rejects reason as well. Because if you're rejecting Christ, then you're accepting a false God. You're not believing in the true God. You know, as, as David says in the Psalms, right, all the gods of the heathens are, are devils. So the distinction has to be made between the true God and false God. St. Paul says this in his letter to the Corinthians. He says there's one God and one Lord Jesus Christ, right? But there are many lords and many gods. Well, Freemasonry invites many lords and many gods, small g, into its lodge room, which the scriptures reveal are really devils. So ultimately, Freemasonry is worshiping the devil. It's inviting demons and devils into its lodge rooms and that's why it doesn't require its members to believe in the Blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It invites you to believe in deity. This is its way of getting the man into the lodge and then indoctrinating him. And, and, and that's unfortunately why most men, once they're in, they, they, don't, they don't leave. So more could be said about that, Steve. But this faith, this, this, this religious test to believe in deity is totally misleading because they don't believe in the true God. If you want to believe that, they'll say that's okay. But when you're in the lodge room, they don't teach you that Christ is the way to salvation. They actually say that being a good Mason is what leads you to salvation. 
you see? So it is a rejection of the supernatural order. Well, John, you're not aware of whether any of the uh, Supreme Court or Masons have both present moment in any of the candidates for the presidency or I don't know Steve, can you repeat that? Because I couldn't hear that gentleman. He wants to know. He wants to know if you know any uh, Supreme Court justices or presidential candidates that are Masons. Well, in my book Masonry Unmasked, I identify all the Freemasonic justices who ruled from the court from 1940 to about 1971. Okay, it was at this time that uh, the Supreme Court began taking establishment clause cases, created this false doctrine of the separation of church and state in our country, and began rooting out Christianity from public life. That was done at the hands of Freemasonic justices. Do I know today? No. Do I suspect that Biden's a Mason? Absolutely. I suspect it. I can't prove it, but it really doesn't matter because they're all espousing the same Masonic philosophy. One world order, one world government, one world religion. That's what they're in for. Why does the media ask them, are they, are they prohibited from identifying the fact that they're Mason? Say again. Steve? He wants to know why the media isn't asking these questions like, are you guys Masons? The Masons own the media. There you go. The media is simply a propaganda outlet for the, the one world order. But there, but there, there are some media that are not about Some, not many. One American News appears to be pretty good. I think you can find a better, you know, a better shot at getting the truth through internet radio. Um, but you know, be that as it may, in the past, it's interesting to note, guys, that in the past, in the '30s, '20s, and '30s. In 40s, the Masonic membership and affiliations were more public. They've become more secretive now. They don't actually advertise their Masonic membership like they, they used to. John, when you made your profession of deity, and you said, in whom do you place your trust? And you said, Jesus. Could you have said Satan? And they would have allowed you to be a Mason? Yes, uh, Satan, you know, is a deity to some people. He's a supreme being, if you will, and that he's certainly of a higher inter intellect and, and in the order of nature than, than man is. Uh, but an ex-Freemason and Satanist himself said this. His name is Bill Sheblin, who you may know. Um, he said that in his profession was Satan, and he gives some, some witnesses to, to, that, to that effect. So... Um, masonry says the only way they'll pull you out of that lodge room by that cable toe is if you're an atheist. Now that's kind of ironic since if you're not, if you're not being led to the true God, you know, you're, you're, you're being led into error. But what they'll say is you got to believe in something. And that's a pretext, a false pretext just to get men into the lodge, to give them the impression that oh, this must be good. This is even a little bit better than a mere fraternity because they're actually spiritual men there, you see? And there's nothing wrong, in my opinion, about requiring a man to believe in God to join a civic organization, okay? I don't have a problem with that. It's the problem is don't talk about God anymore once you're in the organization. See, the problem with Freemasonry is not that it sets this requirement that you have to believe in a God, but its entire ritual and practice is focused and centered upon its understanding of God. That's why the lodge room exists around an altar. The altar is the centerpiece of a lodge room. The letter G, which hangs in the eastern quadrant of the lodge above the head of the worshipful master, and in English-speaking lodges stands for God and Gnosis, and geometry, it stands for geometry because Freemasons believe that only through the geometrical perfection of the universe can man really know anything about God. They certainly don't believe that God has revealed himself through his prophets and through the person of, of Jesus Christ. Um, but that's a pretext, I believe, to draw good men 
And there are good men that go into the lodge. I'm not saying they're not. I mean, they're not recruiting bad men. They're recruiting good men. Uh, and there are many good men on the natural level, I would say, that have been deceived by Freemasonry. The reality is most men do not really comprehend what I'm telling you. Even though they've been Masons for 30 or 40 years, they will tell you, well, John is explaining the rituals correctly, but I really don't follow that. I really never got that much into it. But that's, that's not good enough because you swore an oath to that organization. You swore an oath to uphold its teachings. And so you can't say that I'm not somehow bound to it or support it because if you say that, then guess what? Then you've just sworn a false oath. You've sworn a false and rash oath, and that is a mortal sin. So that's the catch-22 for the Freemason who tries to disclaim, you know, to claim ignorance and disclaim any responsibility for what he claims not to know. You knew you took an oath, and you not only took an oath in your first degree, but you took a like oath in your second degree and your third degree, and you were swearing under the symbolic, symbolic uh, penalties of mutilation and death to uphold the teachings of Freemasonry. So either you are bound to the lodge in covenant, which is contrary to your Catholic faith, or you swore a false and rash oath to Freemasonry, which is also contrary to your Catholic faith. Pretty, pretty scary. <laughs> yeah. It is. Yeah, the oaths are very serious. You know, I made sure I went to confession and I clearly renounced them. You know, I had Catholic deliverance prayers. And, you know, I had a, I had a great miracle of grace in, in my life, you know, in, in, in 1999, over, over 20 years ago. And I, you know, I've, I've lived a very life of peace after this. I, I haven't had any, uh, any uh, you know, other than Freemasons not being quite happy with me. Uh, and I have, I have been getting threats, I, I, not to get into it, but they have attempted to ruin me in many, many different ways. But on the spiritual supernatural level, I mean, God is so merciful. When a man, you know, comes in, in repentance, he's going to be completely freed of these. The, the problem is uh, those men, especially Catholic men, who have unknowingly bound themselves to Freemasonry through these oaths, you know, I, I can tell you in what I've studied and even talking to, you know, the spiritual masters and theologians, whether man knows it or not, there is something that objectively happens when a man swears those oaths and he will suffer. He will suffer spiritual consequences of it. That's just how God has established the objective spiritual order. Um, it, 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 we can talk about other instances, for example, if a priest uh, exercises his ministry outside of the scope of his authority or faculties, the spiritual theologians say Satan and demons attack priests like that. Um, so, you know, the way God has, has, has dealt with these things, there are consequences to these oaths. And there's a theology of oaths that the church talks about. And the men who are bound to these oaths, you know, what I found is that when they finally swear that oath, there's something that happens to them. They, they shut down. Completely. I've seen this in my own practical experience, and that is because the oath does have a spiritual power over them. It causes a spiritual blindness uh, over these men, and that's exactly why Freemasonry requires the oath. Freemasonry even says in its own writings, a man cannot be a Mason without swearing an oath. You cannot go to Masonry and say, can I just make a promise or, you know, can I give you my word? No. You have to swear an oath, and an oath is different than a promise. What you guys do in the Knights of Columbus, I went through that myself. That is not an oath. You are making a promise uh, on your word. But Freemasonry is an oath because it's summoning God to call to witness what you are swearing. You are swearing by his name and not invoking your own name and your own reputation, but actually calling upon God himself to participate in this evil and there is a consequence to summoning almighty god to participate in evil whether the mason knows it or not that's why this is so spiritually detrimental to these men are there any questions 
Don, we've, uh, we've probably got to wrap this up, but I want to thank you on behalf of the council for what you said, and I expect we might want to invite you back to have some more of this conversation. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. It's been my, my pleasure. I very much appreciate it. And uh, hopefully you have a better understanding of, of, of this evil out there. But we need more men to understand this so that we can, can reach our, our fellow Catholics who got ensnared in this. Thank you. Thank you.